So the uh, hibiscus flowers are good food. They're rich in iron, no bad taste whatsoever, a little bit slimy like okra. Most people don't mind that. And if you don't overpower the salad, then it is a nice, delightful addition to any green salad. Locally, women will give the flowers to eat, especially to young gals with menstrual problems. Just eat these flowers. They say nine flowers a day during your menstrual cycle will prevent menstrual pains as well as excessive menstruation. Every summer, we have a summer bush medicine camp for children. This year, we had our 21st, where every year, 24 children from ages 9 to 12 and at least 12 young teenage counselors come to live for one week in the bush and learn about medicinal plants and traditional healing. When the children arrive, they are often anemic. So we tell them, you can stay. You're too tired to get up. You're too tired to play games. You don't want to sing and dance and clap your hands. So you can stay if you eat three hibiscus flowers every day. Here's your bush, here's your bush, and here's your food. And every day they have to eat those three flowers and within four days, there is a marked difference in their attitude, their activity and energy level. So if you're feeling tired and you don't like drink no kind of medicine, eat the hibiscus flowers. It really, really helps for people with anemia. For women who are of childbearing age, hibiscus can be a lifesaver for threatened miscarriage. I witnessed it myself many times, and what we do with the hibiscus then is we will take this, I have to credit Ms. Hortense Robinson, our famous traditional healer from um, Ladyville in Belize District, who passed away in 2010. This is her formula, and she would take nine red hibiscus flowers. Four open, five closed. Four open, five closed. You know what a closed hibiscus flower looks like, correct? Okay. Nine leaves and one tablespoon of cinnamon. If you have the cinnamon stick, this much. One finger size cinnamon stick. You put that in a liter, a quart of water. Boil 10 minutes. Set it aside and let it cool. It has to be given cool to prevent miscarriage. If it's not given cool, it will not work. And this is why Ms. Hortense was always known as Mil Secretos, a thousand secrets. Now when the woman feels like she's in week eight, week 10, week 12, and she begins to experience light spotting, bleeding, that's the time to start immediately and sip, sip, sip on that quart all day long. We don't ask her to take a full glass at a time, but she should consume that quart. And if the end, at the end of the afternoon, she's finished it, make another one. At Ms. Hortense's funeral, there were at least 10 women there who brought their adult children whose lives were saved in utero by this formula of hibiscus and cinnamon. And it's an interesting experiment. If you make this, pour some out into a saucer and let it cool. Maybe make it in the evening, pour a little bit into a dish, leave it overnight, and in the morning, it's jello. It gels itself. And that is the effect that it has on the uterine membrane. It will cover the mucous membrane of the uterus with this jelly-like material. And it is also astringent, so it pinches the capillaries of the uterine wall to prevent miscarriage. It's a very, very effective anti-miscarriage. We use hibiscus flowers and leaves 
for herbal baths for all matter of skin conditions no matter what, all types of skin conditions, most especially infected sores, bug bites, mosquito bites, rashes, sunburn, heat burn, kitchen burn, any of those work for that purpose. So what we would do is gather a handful of flowers and leaves, and for this purpose, for herbal baths, any color any color of hibiscus flower works. But pink and red would always be preferable. So we gather a handful of flowers and leaves, and by a handful, I'd say it's that much. Un puño grande, doble puño, they say in Spanish. So a big double handful, and you simply drop that into a bucket, fill the bucket with water, and then you begin to squeeze and mash squeeze and mash until all the plant material is broken and then you have a kind of a reddish tint to the flower it's ready you can put it in the sun warm it up a little bit if you like but it also is very effective just bathing the area you get a cup and you pour that cup over the rash over the sores and the uh, effect is quite impressive quite almost miraculous all right, any questions about hibiscus? Yes. How do you grow it? You grow it from a cutting. You take a piece of the stem, and I find that the younger stems that are somewhat woody but not so thick and not weak, the middle-sized stems, they are the best. Take off the leaves and take off the flowers. Put it into the ground and make sure nobody moves it. As long as it doesn't get bumped or moved, it will sprout in a matter of 10, 10 to 14 days. And you'll see little leaves coming out the side, and it's off and running. It's very easy. It's by propagation. Okay. Yes. A coagulant. It's called mucilaginous. It's a mucilage, mucilaginous plant. Yes, I would say it's a coagulant. Yeah, that's why it stops uterine bleeding. Yes. In excess, could it be bad? It might be bad if a young woman is on her first days of her cycle. You wouldn't want to do it then because it may prevent free flow. But no, I never heard anyone say, oh, I drank so much, now I feel sick. No, no. Yes. Would it help with preterm labor? By preterm labor, you probably mean 30-some weeks. No. If there is spotting at 30-some weeks, yes. But preterm labor, no. In fact, it, uh, it improves labor, which means it might make it faster because of that slippery nature that it has. It helps babies slip out more quickly. So no, it would not be beneficial for that. Anything else? Yes. Any benefit for, good, I'm glad you asked that question. We actually make a poultice of the leaves and the flowers, mash them with your hands, just a little bit of water until it's all kind of slimy. Then you put it in a cloth, cover the cloth like a little envelope, and then put that on the head. Yes. A migraine, I, I wouldn't swear by a migraine, but a common headache, for sure. And some of, uh, I've seen uh, farm workers make that same hibiscus mash and put it on their head under their hats when they work in the sun all day because it keeps the sun from heating up. Most people in Belize have black hair. The sun on black hair is more concentrated than it is on people with light hair. So one good reason to keep a hat on, but even when it's super hot, you can still get a heat headache. And so then keeping the hibiscus right on your head, it drips a little, but it goes away. That does help a lot. It cools, it's very, very cooling. In fact, everyone 
who's tried the poultice for headaches, the very first comment is, oh, that feels so cool. Ooh, did you come that, did that come out of the refrigerator? Anything else? Yes. Why do four have to be open and five have to be closed in the formula? Well, that's why we call Ms. Hortens Mil Secretos. I wish she were here to answer that question. If I asked her, you know what she said? Because it's good. Why is it good? Because that's the way. Why is that the way? Because that's good. <laughs> you know, that's traditional wisdom, and you cannot put a why or a because on it. But if Ms. Horten said it, you can write it in stone for sure. All right, let's move on to roses. Since I don't have my slide presentation, I want to focus on plants that everybody is familiar with. And again, I'm talking exclusively about red roses. Now, we mentioned uh, birth problems earlier, and I would say that I have been a herbalist since the 1970s. And the day that I decided to become a herbalist happened in the hills of Guerrero, Mexico, where I was living at the time because my boyfriend and I were draft, he was a draft dodgers, we were running away from the American draft and the Vietnam War. And we settled in the far, far, far hills of Guerrero, Mexico, where it was an 18-hour bus ride on the Flecha Roja to a small village called Clacotepec, and from Clacotepec, a 14-hour walk to this little village called Salitre, si. Salitre, where about 50 people lived in six little huts, thatch huts. And one night, there was a festival in town, and I, too lazy to walk 14 hours to go to a fiesta, I stayed home. Everybody else in the village went to the fiesta except myself, Doña Rita, who was a very uh, old, infirmed lady, a grandmother, and Margarita, who was 40 weeks pregnant, so she wasn't going to ride the horse for 14 hours. Well, in the middle of the night, I hear, I get up, and my goodness, who could it possibly be? Everybody's gone. I open the door, and there's Doña Rita on her hands and knees because she was so arthritic, she couldn't stand up, about 80 years old at the time. She says to me in Spanish, Rosita, apurate, vistate, levantate, get up, hurry up, get dressed, follow me. We're going to deliver Margarita's baby right now. <gasps> Me, Doña Rita, I've never seen a baby born. I don't know what to do. You'll probably have two patients. I think I'll faint. I can't. I can't help you. I don't know what to do. And she looked at me the way Mexican women look at gringas. Where have you been all your life? You know nothing. So numbly and dumbly, I follow behind Doña Rita. And about four hours later, we deliver Margarita's fifth child, beautiful baby boy. And I'm holding this baby in my arms, rocking, and I'm saying, what was I so afraid of? This was so easy. I want to be a midwife. Next thing I know, Doña Rita says, put that baby down. We got a problem here. There's too much bleeding, mucha sangre. And you, go outside. It's still dark. Take this pine pitch torch, go outside and bring me nine roses and this much of the stem and the leaves. And don't complain about the thorns. Be quick. So I go outside and I'm shaking, I'm really afraid, and I've got this pitch of pine trying to hold that and then trying to cut nine ro red roses with this much like Ms. Hortense, like Don Eligio, these people never went to school. They don't know what six inches is. They don't know nine or 10 or 30 centimeters. This much was the measure of the stem and the leaf. So I bring it back into the kitchen. And in the meantime, Dona Rita had put up in a clay pitcher about two and a half cups of water to boil. 
she poured all the roses and all the stems and leaves into that boiling pot over the hearth and let it boil about 10 minutes. And again, how traditional wisdom is spread throughout the world, she said it had to be cooled. Remember, the previous one with hibiscus for miscarriage must also be cool. Hot expands, cold contracts. So she put me to stand in the doorway with two big gourds and moved that tea back and forth in the wind until it cooled. In the meantime, she had tied Margarita's ankles up to the beams of the roof to put her on an angle like that. So I sat with Margarita and I spooned that rose tea into her mouth and looked at my watch and in eight minutes the dripping stopped. In eight minutes the dripping stopped. So I said to myself, I don't know what happened tonight. I don't know how a simple thing like nine red roses could save a woman's life. In the morning we had a, a woman with her fifth child intact and me not traumatized. And I said to myself, if I have to walk over hot coals and nails, no matter what it takes, I will find out what saved Margarita's life. And it turns out that roses contain tannic acid and gallotannic acid. These are astringents astringents that are strong enough, again, to pinch that uterine membrane closed to stop the flushing. It's a benefit, perhaps that's the way God made women, that the uterine membrane has a capillary bed of blood supply. A capillary is almost invisible. So they're so, so small embedded into the uterine membrane that it doesn't take a whole lot of chemistry to pinch it with an astringent and close off the bleeding. Understand? All right, so roses for postpartum bleeding, excessive menstruation, definitely, works really well. Baby diarrhea, perfect. Beautiful for baby diarrhea, and just about everybody has roses in their backyard. For baby diarrhea, we would take one large rose or three of the smaller roses with their stems and leaves. It's really important that you include stems and leaves because a large part of their components are in the leaves as well as the flowers. So one large or three small with the stems and leaves, one cup of water for a baby. You boil that 10 minutes, and then it has to be cool. If it's, you need it now, put it in the refrigerator if you have one, or put it out in the wind where there's a breeze to get it cool as quickly as possible. Strain it, and you could put it into a baby bottle, or if it's a very small infant, very wisely uh, women in Belize, most of Central America, say you should never introduce a metal spoon into a baby's mouth. That is the cause of thrush. So what I've seen them do is boil rags, cotton cloths. Take it out, pick, take out a piece of cotton cloth about that big, and then dip it into the tea and put it into the baby's mouth, and the baby will take it. Also doesn't taste terrible. You've seen what is known as baby red eye. Newborn babies sometimes within a few days have develop a little red uh, spot in the corner of the eye. A very well strained, very well strained rose tea by the same formula I gave you for the diarrhea. And you just drop it into the eye several times a day, one, two, or three drops. And that works very quickly. Used it many times myself. Questions? Comments? Anybody else use roses for medicine? Okay. Nopal. Skajanil. We all know Nopal, correct? Everybody familiar Nopal? Okay. In Belize, 
most uh, people think of it as food. In Mexico, it's more medicine than food. So there are many different ways. I know that everybody talks about aloe vera for burns. Personally, I think the gel that comes out of nopal is infinitely more effective than aloe vera. Yes, yes, who said that? Yes, true. Yeah, you take one of those pads, one of those leaves, and scrape off. First of all, you need gloves. I usually use the kitchen glove you use for the oven to approach the nopal because it's prickly, and you get those thorns in your skin, and it hurts for about 10 days. They're very difficult. They're almost invisible, and you can't even touch your fingers. They're so sensitive. So make sure you cover your hand with something like an oven glove or a garden glove, and you pull off. You just break off one of those pankas or leaves, scrape off all the thorns with the kitchen knife, but do it really good until the surface of the pad is kind of white. Then you slice that pad in half, and inside is this jello, serious medicinal gel. And when you scrape it, it just drips. So you scrape the inside and let that drip over the burn. You don't even have to touch the burn because that can be very painful. I'm talking about third degree blisters. I once treated a, a person who was a tourist in Belize, came to the old rainforest medicine trail we used to run now still there, now owned and operated by my neighbors at Chalk Creek. This tourist came who had been kayaking out on the Keys. He was eight hours out in the sun. It's like February and the dude is from Minnesota. So he hasn't seen sunlight in about four months. Now eight hours out on the sea kayaking. When he came to see me, I nearly fainted. His blisters on his ankles and feet up to the knees where he had no covering were this high. Burn blisters like that, and it was more blister than skin. And I said, man, you better go to the hospital. I really think this is too serious for herbal remedies. It looks like you could get a serious infection. I really recommend the hospital. And he said, oh, no, not a hospital. I'm so scared. I'm afraid of doctors. I couldn't. No, no, no. Anyway, he basically refused to go. So we rigged up. My husband is a great engineer, very creative. He made a little cardboard box with a sling to put his foot in so he could sleep overnight. And what we did is we took down a good 10 of those nopal leaves, did exactly what I said, scraped them, and every hour around the clock, I got up every hour to pour those because once you put the nopal on that blister, it just sucked in and it was dry within 10 minutes. So every hour I poured that nopal gel on top of his burn and in the morning, all blisters are gone. All blisters are gone. And what's behind is a very raw pink flesh, but no more blisters. He stayed another 24 hours, and by the time he left, they were 80% healed, just with that nopal. So I've never been afraid of blister burns again after that. And I never saw one as bad as that fellow either. For bruises, works beautifully. I once had a terrible bruise falling on a Maya temple. I slipped and fell on a stone on this side of my leg. I had a bruise that was black, 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 and blue for weeks. But what we did, again, fortunately for me, a traditional healer was close by. We took a piece of the nopal split it open and just laid the open nopal on the bruise. And you know, within about, again, 30 minutes, it's all dried up like you cooked it. It draws the heat of injuries and wounds and burns right out. So every 30 minutes, I replaced it. And by the time I put on the third one, I took it off and there was bits of blue blood stuck into the nopal.
So what did it do? It drew out all of that bruised, hardened blood so that fresh blood could come in and heal the wound. So I kept that on, changing it three or four times a day. And by the third day, I'd say I was incredibly more comfortable. So you can rely on it for those bad bruises. For hair, I think probably everybody here has had, had their head soaked in nopal. Yes? Who has had their head soaked in nopal? Wow, I'm amazed. Well, you see, there's an old time remedy going away by the wayside. <laughs> for a uh, hair rinse, for if you want your hair to get really soft, and for people who have knotty hair, they like it to be soft, you scrape all that gel, put it on, and for falling hair. When people are under great emotional strain and stress, they often lose their hair. We've seen that happen very often, especially people who grieve, people who have a recent long string of hardships, their hair starts to fall out. A soak in the nopal gel brings back the normal growth of the hair and also improves the hair that is growing. All right, questions about nopal. It's delicious, very, very tasty and nutritious, but I would say you should not eat too much at one meal. You take that gel in, and it sort of um, covers up all your food, and it makes digestive enzymes hard to get in. So a small strip, one or two strips of one leaf is fine. Your body can handle that, but like a whole meal of nopal and a little bit of rice or a little piece of meat, you will have a digestive problem, only because the gel has a hard time allowing the digestive enzyme in. Questions? Yes. Oh, well, the fruit, <coughs> personally, I, you know, I think is kind of bland. And again, it has thorns. But the fruit is super rich in iron. Very, very high in iron, so it's really good for anemia. In Mexico, they, you, they sell it in the marketplaces all the time. And you see mothers buying it for small children because it's sweet, it's pleasant, and it's like a big drink of pure iron. OK? Was there a question? Marigolds, flor de muerto, ishtipu in Maya. Easy to grow. They will reseed themselves. Nopal too, Nopal requires no attention whatsoever. You just give it space and leave it alone. Uh, don't let too many other plants get around it because then it gets weak and falls over. Uh, the marigolds will reseed themselves or you can buy seed packages very easily. Um, I prefer those that are about 18 inches high the really big ones that get to be three feet, they often fall over. The medicinal part is the flower. And I would say that its most famous use is for baby colic, most famous all across Central America. When I lived in Chicago, before I came to Belize, I always grew marigold flowers. And the Mexican women lined up down my garden path to come for the marigold flowers. And why? What are you using this for? Oh, for baby. For baby. El colico de los niños. So what they do is take one of the large flowers, three smaller flowers, and just drop it into boiling water. Don't boil it. Just drop it in. Let it sit for 10 minutes. And then strain really well so you don't introduce little plant pieces into the baby's throat. Strain it really well, preferably through a cloth. And then the baby takes unsweetened uh, ounce every hour, one ounce every hour. And if there's a baby that's not bottle fed, remember you boil some old cloths, take those cloths, dip it into the tea, and the baby sucks it right up. One ounce every hour. And good if you rub the baby's tummy. 
always important, just rubbing downward and then rubbing in circles really, really helps. If it's a tiny infant, I like to take the knees and pull them right up against the chest. Do that several times, push the knees into the chest and <laughs> and you can watch the belly go down. You can also do the same tea for adults who have digestive problems. Those people who say everything I eat upsets my stomach, I eat a little bit and I'm full right away, a half a cup of marigold tea before dinner, before meal, half a cup after. And what it does is it stimulates digestive enzymes to get moving. It adds more digestive power to your stomach. They're also edible. You can break up one big flower and sprinkle it on top of a salad and it makes a lovely presentation. Now we use it a lot for herbal bathing. People who uh, have trouble sleeping, people who are in a state of nervous anxiety, people with skin sores, skin infections, bad rashes, we take a double handful of leaves, stems, and flowers. Mash it, you don't need to boil, just mash up into a bucket. This one you want to sit in the sun for about an hour. Strain it because you don't want any bits or pieces of the, the flower or the stem to get into a sore or a burn. So if you're going to bathe sores, you definitely want to strain really well, preferably through a cloth. Could you imagine getting a stem in your burn and somebody has to go in with the tweezer? Oh. <clears throat> so that's why you want to be careful with that. For people who are with nervous anxiety or don't sleep well, we pour a good bucket of marigold flowers over them. Just keep pouring and pouring and pouring. Give them a warm towel, very important to keep them warm. At bedtime, obviously, would be the best. And it really works extremely well for sleepless babies and children, especially babies who have nightmares or children. You wouldn't know, you might know a baby had a nightmare, but a child could tell you I had a bad dream. And so do we all know what susto is? Susto? Fright. Fright. We all know how we get susto. Who doesn't know what susto is? You don't know. Susto is a, an emotional condition that occurs after you have had a recent fright. Something like um, almost being in a car accident, being in a car accident, uh, maybe uh, getting mugged, maybe you're afraid for a walk around Belize City at nighttime. And when you get home, you feel like this, right? Maybe somebody tried to grab your bag or you think you're going to be late and everything that you went to do is not going to happen. That's what we call susto. Makes your heart beat fast. You feel frightened all the time. You feel nervous. You don't eat well. You don't sleep well. So susto has a lot of content to it. Nothing better. For children with susto, for instance, in the small villages when the uh, British Army was still in Belize, they had their Harrier jets, and those Harrier jets used to break the sound barrier. Remember that? You all too young. But when the Brits were here, there were these sonic booms going overhead two or three times a day as they're testing their equipment. So in a small village, picture a baby sound asleep, dancing on the clouds with the angels, and then all of a sudden, boom, and the baby <gasps> wakes up like that. That baby could be screaming for hours, that baby could get diarrhea, that baby could be throwing up nonstop. Nothing physical wrong with the baby, the baby has susto. We bathe that baby, that child, that person in marigold flowers, and magnificent to see the difference. The nerves calm down, 
the baby will be asleep before you finish the bath. I saw it myself. I was called to a home where there had been a uh, robbery and a murder, and a 14-month-old baby witnessed the robbery and the murder. And since that, the baby could not sleep, would not eat, and scream, scream, scream. Basically screaming bloody murder. And I arrived with my bags of marigold and roses, and I mix, mixed a bath. The baby, of course, wanted nothing to do with me. So I put the mother and the baby into a shower stall, and I bathed mother and baby together. And with, after I put the third hikara of bath water onto the baby, you could just feel the calmness come over the baby. And it started to smile. Before we finished, it was sound asleep. And it didn't wake up for 16 hours. So marigold is both a very spiritual plant and a physical plant as well. But in those cases where there has been recent fright or traumas, marigold bath. Questions, comments? Yes. Flor de Muerto, yes. Ah, why is it called Flor de Muerto? Because in uh, Mexico, mostly Mexico, it is always on the Day of the Dead altar. The Day of the Dead altar is November 1st, November 2nd, and the belief of the Mexican people is that the marigold flower has the ability actually to call the souls of the dead to return. And when they return, they have a party with the living, and they ask the living, what do you need this year? You need more corn, you need another baby, you need better domestic relationships, and the promise is that the dead will do what they can on the other side to help the living. But the marigold flowers call them. Okay? Yes? Can Susto become a long-term condition if it's not treated? Yes, 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 most definitely. Um, it's, you know, it's all over the world. To think about how those um, poor refugees, the immigrants marching up Mexico looking for a better life. Think about the Somali refugees, the people in Rohingya, Think about our own country with all of the, the, the crime, the robberies going on. I think that as a nation, we can all have susto. And I think to a degree, our entire nation has susto. When there is a big, uh, when there's a war, people who are not treated from war traumas will suffer for the rest of their lives. And I have treated people who came to me from a war-torn zone. And their, their symptoms are almost always enormous. It's we call a laundry list. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. Most people do not sleep well. They wake up <gasps> like that. All of a sudden, they're sound asleep, and then <gasps> they wake up, and the heart is pounding, right? They have bad dreams. Often the dream involves getting chased, somebody about to push you off a cliff. And then you just wake up before you fall off the cliff. So yes, it can become long-term and chronic. Anybody else? Marigold flowers? Yes. Is there a similar species often mistaken? There are probably dozens of tagetes. Tagetes, tagetes is the Latin name. There are different ones, but I know from my experience, a marigold is a marigold is a marigold. And they all work medicinally. They all work for baths, for physical and spiritual purposes. All right, let's talk about culantro, and then I guess I'm done. Yes, go ahead. You know, I can't hear a word you're saying. Sure.
Sure. You can keep it, yeah, you can keep it about three days in the fridge, but you should never give it cold. If you're going to keep it in the fridge, you have to, have to, have to warm it up. Cold things on a, on a troubled stomach would be very uh, counterproductive, make the person worse <coughs> than better. So we all know culantro, yes, that delightful spice. Many people are not aware that it is both food and medicine. First of all, we're supposed to talk about growing it. You, all you really need to do is give it space. In fact, in my little garden, it's become a bit of a problem. It's taking over. Yet my culantro plants are this high. The leaves are that long. So they are, of course, very, very tasty and delicious. They're good if you, if you have a person in the family who has a lot of gas, burping, or out the other side, put culantro in the soup. Chop it up in their salad. You will notice the difference, and if you eat a lot of beans, you know, beans, beans, the magical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. <laughs> Always eat some culantro, just one leaf, with your beans to prevent that. It's kind, you know, it's kind of funny, but if you have to do, you have to go to class, you have to go to work, and everybody knows it's you, <laughs> culantro can prevent that. So it makes a very good tea for stomach ache. As a tea, it's really delightful. I usually use six leaves to one cup. Six leaves to one cup, and you want to boil that about five minutes. Steep it for 10 minutes, you know what steep is. Just take it off the fire covered and let it sit. All of those uh, plants that have high aromas like marigold and roses and culantro, they need to be covered because what gives them aroma are called essential oils and those essential oils go off in steam. So you always want to keep that pot covered. For vomiting in children, the same tea, about six leaves per cup. It's also good for diarrhea in children. In Mexico, um, the culantro is known as snakeweed. They use it as a poultice on snake bites. The only place in the Central America that I heard that but it's something good to know in case you have that misfortune. They make a paste of the leaf and the flower. And you know the flower is that prickly. So it's kind of uh, a, it's a sign, it's a message, a signature from nature. You could use this for things that bite. So they make a paste of the leaf and the flower and they apply it to the snake bite. They say it will draw the poison and draw the scale. It's very important when a snake bites that little scale on his fang usually stays in the skin. And that has to be removed for a complete healing to occur. So that will pull out the venom and it will pull out the little fang as well, the, the, the um, scale from the fang. You want to apply that four to six times in 24 hours. So every few hours you want to renew that. All right, uh, my time is up. I'd be happy to take questions. Uh, a few, what's good for? We call the curbside diagnosis. <laughs> yes. I do. Uh, I have 11 books. Rainforest Remedies. Imagine you've seen this around. I'm the author of that book. It's in English and Spanish. It's 100 Healing Herbs of Belize. It's not my information. It's information that was gleaned from 12 different traditional healers in Belize from Corozal to Punta Gorda. I will have them after lunch available. And then uh, Messages from the Gods is the scientific tome of the Belize Ethnobotany Project. It is the result of 27 years of medicinal plant research in Belize with the New York Botanical Garden.
Anything else? Yes. Diabetes, Kalalu. Kalalu. I didn't get a chance to get there, but the reason I consider Kalalu or amaranth a medicinal plant is because we give it to people with anemia. It works wonderfully. I'm, when I was, I guess, in my late 60s, I fell and broke this arm. And I went to Belize City. I was very, very well treated by Dr. Andre Sosa. I could always sing his praises. And I came back in six weeks for another x-ray. And he said, wow, I never thought a woman your age could heal so well of a broken bone. He said, hmm, you must be drinking a lot of dairy, taking a lot of milk. And I said, not a drop. And he said, well, what did you do? Lone kalalu. Every single day, raw in salad sauteed by itself. I like it just sauteed with a little bit of oil, nothing else, and a little salt and pepper. Yeah, you can do onion and garlic and all of that, but it's a five-minute saute. So eating a lot of kalalu will bring down the sugar naturally. In fact, I participated in an anti-diabetic research program with the New York Botanical Garden and another pharmaceutical company, and I sent them 22 edible plants from Belize. And amaranth was number one for bringing down diabetic problems and lifting insulin levels from the pancreas. Kalalu was number one for all 22 of those plants. And then there's Billy Webb bark. Billy Webb bark, if it is full blown, but there is, it is not ethical to um, recommend uh, remedies for type 2 diabetes. Sometimes they help. I have seen that a person can take less of the injectable insulin, taking uh, Billy Webb bark, but it's not going to be a cure, but you can cure type, wait a minute, I got it reversed. Type 1 diabetes is difficult. Type 2 diabetes can be corrected with herbal remedies and food. Type 1 is more difficult, but I have seen people with type 1 diabetes drink the Billy Webb bark, and they can take less of their insulin injection. But a cure, I haven't seen it happen. And I could say diabetes is caused by susto. Never, ever, ever in my whole career did I ever see a case of diabetes that didn't start with susto. Yes, it's a sugar problem. Yes, it's an insulin problem. But that all began with an emotional condition known as susto. Yes. Kidney stones in children. Give them a tea from the corn silk hair. The silk on the corn, give them tea of that. And because it tastes like corn on the cob, they will drink it. And nothing else to drink but that. And you probably need three or four days. And then uh, some, something that, uh, like a little bit of nopal in their diet doesn't take much because when the kidney stones pass, they can be very painful. So with nopal, it will coat the tubules and the bladder so that they don't um, scratch as they pass. But the, um, the uh, corn silk will also break them down. But sometimes they still pass too large. Yes, yes. Well, I've never tried an artificial system. I don't know. I do know that the medicinal plants are hardy, and they're also uh, cooperative. The Lord put them here for us, and I firmly believe with all my heart, if they know you need them, they will grow. Whenever I go to a person's house as a visitor, I'm often asked, what's good for? You know what I do? I go to the backyard. Just go to the backyard because what they need is there. It's amazing. I know it sounds incredible. But if there is a backyard with weeds, <laughs> wild plants, more than likely the plant they need is already there. Yes. Yes. 
It's a, yeah. it's a symbiotic relationship with humanity, the Lord, and plants. Yes. I'm sorry, Beth? For cleaning the immune system. Uh, strengthening. Do you know the uh, John Charles? Yeah, John Charles is the best for the immune system. It's very pleasant, tasting, easy to grow. In fact, it can take over. Right, so John Charles. I uh, wouldn't recommend you overdo it. I would say nine days on, nine days off, nine days on, nine days off. Yes. As a tea. Yes. Coco Mecca, blanco or rojo? Both, okay. Coco Mecca is the Mexican wild yam. Um, that is, uh, has a lot of uh, local uses for arthritis and rheumatism and heart troubles. If you, everybody know the Mexican wild yam, the Coco Mecca, looks like a big giant human heart. But it's all kind of gnarly, just like the joints of an arthritic. Uh, the elders like to make the tea of the white Coco Mecca for heart troubles. It was a surprise to me. I never read it. I never heard a traditional healer say it. But I do know that elders came to my farm to get the Coco Mecca specifically for heart troubles. Exactly what time? And there's a lot of different heart problems, right? So I know for sure it's good for rheumatism and arthritis. I know that women take it uh, for fertility, for lack of menstruation, excessive menstruation, so it's a woman's herb as well. The red coco mecca or the china root, and you know why they call it china root? You have to dig to China, forget it. <laughs> it's, it's this deep underground, and if it's a muddy day, don't even bother. So the red coco mecca is very good to build the blood, building the blood and cleansing the blood, super rich in iron, we usually put it together in a blood tonic. The blood tonic is the white, uh, white china, white <laughs> wild yam and the red china root together. Very, very good for rheumatism, for arthritis, for aches and pains, building the blood, cleansing the blood. Pardon? Yes, you can. You go to the marketplace, they're very commonly sold, yes. I've never been to the herbal market in Belmopan, but I know in San Ignacio, the herb sellers, and this lady right here, Eva, has it for sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Question in the back? Right, somebody has to repeat that. Swollen tonsils. <laughs> I guess ice water, <laughs> you know. Maybe a really cold rose tea, that would work. But then you want to really drink slow, maybe even gargle. Gargle with cold rose tea. Hibiscus tea would work really well. And then do this. Okay. All right, one more, yes. Thyroid issue, I'm uh, going to um, going to bow out on that one. It's too complicated, and you need to talk to the person. Every person with the thyroid condition is a whole other story. Okay? Never met two who are the same. Um, go ahead. Yes, you can. Can you take these remedies even if you don't have the ailment? Um, using common sense, yes. Marigold has no negative side effects whatsoever, so yes, you could. As I said, eating too much nopal can upset your digestion. Uh, you wouldn't want to drink a lot of rose tea because it'd make you constipated. Understood? So if you think about what the plant is being used to correct, if you don't have that condition, you might cause the very opposite. We're using rose tea for, const for, for diarrhea. If you don't have diarrhea, you drink a lot of it, you might get constipated. Okay, uh, another question, go ahead. Ashkanan? 
Ashkenan is magnificent. I love it, love it, love it. I grow it all over my farm. If I could have shown my slides, you see I have a 50-foot trail of Ashkenan. If you just leave it alone, it turns into a tree. You cut the flowers and the leaves, and it's called in Spanish, sana lo todo. Sana lo todo means cure everything, but it means cure every type of skin condition, every type of skin condition. So it doesn't matter what it is, a burn, kitchen burn, sunburn, rashes, infections, anything of that nature, um, Ashkenan is the answer for a cool bath. I have used it sometimes very warm if I see infected sores, because you want the sore to open, right? You want the rash to close. You want the sore to open. So we always have to apply the God-given logic that we have. So I use it for that purpose. You can also uh, drink it as an aid for anemia because it's super rich in iron. Those red plants like roses, hibiscus, ashkenan, they are rich in iron. That's how they make red. Couldn't make red if you didn't have iron in your roots and in your leaves. So that's what they draw up from the soil. All right, thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>